said in the uh, sanctuary they used to me um, and so um, let's have word of prayer gracious wonderful kind God we thank you for this day thank you for this time of sharing God we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds that we may hear and receive what thus says the Lord God uh, use us tonight for that glory the power of that grace divine we ask it all Lord in Jesus name we pray let the church say amen. All right. Um, let me thank those who are worshiping virtually tonight, uh, those who are in the sanctuary, as well as those who are worshiping virtually. If you would just hit the share button um, so those persons on your page can be blessed by our Bible study tonight. If you would go to our app, our church app, The Emmanuel Temple, uh, in the sermon notes, uh, is the Bible study handout for tonight under the sermon notes is the Bible study handout for tonight we are going to 1st Corinthians chapter 11 1st Corinthians chapter 11 and I want to lift up in your hearing verses 23 through 29 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 23 through 29. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to refer you to your handout on tonight. Okay. We good, everybody? All right, let me. Okay. So I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you this do in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes whoever therefore eats the bread 
or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. This is the word of God for the people of God. The people said, thanks be to God. So, Jesus, before he died, sat around a table similar to this with his friends. Paul, who was not there at the table, lifts this passage up to the people at Corinth because they had some serious issues. And and so I'm I'm in my handout. So Paul criticizes the Corinthians for their problems they had associated with the Lord's Supper. They were having the Lord's Supper, but they had defiled the Lord's Supper And they had completely messed it up. And as you remember, as we've been talking through Paul and Corinthians, Paul is constantly critiquing the church at Corinth to help them understand and get them on the right track. And so Paul here again in chapter 11 is critiquing them because apparently people in the congregation brought food to the meeting which was used for the bread and wine as they shared in the Lord's Supper. Now, we got to understand that the Lord's Supper, this takes place. We are no longer, Jesus has already been ascended back into heaven. And so these Lord's Suppers are taking place at different people's houses and they're having potluck dinners. But we get some problems. And Paul addresses these problems in Corinth. First of all, the first problem is they've got an individuality and not community. They didn't eat together. They, each family went ahead and ate on its own without regard for others. Now, my brothers and sisters, we know table manners say that when some, when you're going out to eat to dinner with persons, you don't eat when you get your food. You wait till everybody gets their what? Food. And then you all eat what? Together. That's not what the church of Corinth was doing. I got my food. So I'm going to what? I'm going to eat my food. Then you not only have an individuality versus a community, you also have the rich versus the poor. In these potluck dinners, in these individual houses, the rich who could afford to bring food were not sharing their food with the poor and who sometimes the poor had nothing to bring. Now, a table is, notice the table, y'all. The table is open. And if the table is going to be open to whosoever will, then we've got to understand that if the table is open to whosoever will, we can't have divisions and we can't have issues with rich people and poor people because the rich people did not want to share with the poor people. And how does it make a person feel when they come to a potluck and they don't have anything to bring and you tell them they can't eat? Now, as you know, every fifth Sunday, we do Soul Food Sunday. And I often tell everybody who did not bring anything that they are my special guest 
and that they can go what? Eat. And I also say that our guests who are persons who have never been here before, they can go eat what? First. Be careful when you entertain strangers. You just may be entertaining what? Angels. And so if I have very little anyway, and if I come to this house for this potluck fellowship dinner, and they make me feel bad that I don't have anything, that I did not bring anything, how is that going to make me feel? Okay, y'all yeah, might as well. So you can just bring them on in. We'll put them on the table. We'll know who to go send for pastor props the next time and who not to go send. <laughs> so we also are dealing with the questions. Okay, Sister Carla, you got any questions so far already? I'm in first. I mean, I'm in First Corinthians chapter eleven, verses twenty-three through twenty-nine. And those who are worshiping virtually, our digital disciples, if you have some questions, um, please pop in. We'd be glad to, uh, to share them and, and try to answer them. So not only we've got divisions of the rich and poor, but we also have slaves who've got access to very little resources. And because they only have access to very little resources, they are made to feel bad as well because of the fact that they don't have enough to bring. So one of the things that Paul is addressing is divisions in the house. Okay? Questions, questions, comments. We good, Sister Andrea, Sister Angie, we, we good? Do I need to back up? Okay? Man, so not only we have divisions, but we also have excess. Some people, y'all, brought and consumed so much wine at the meeting, they got drunk. It's nothing worse than a person coming to the fellowship and they trying to drink up all of the wine. They're trying to eat up all of the food. And then got three takeout plates here somewhere. I think I think I've been to y'all somebody's house. Okay? Questions? Any questions? So, because of this sloppy worship, y'all, and being out of order. We get Paul's explanation on the meaning and the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Paul wants them to celebrate the Lord's Supper in a way that demonstrates unity rather than their divisions. So Paul, the Corinthian church needed the powerful blood and body of Christ because of their own brokenness. So the purpose, now, now we got to understand this, and y'all write this down, highlight this. The purpose of the Lord's Supper was not a memorial meal for a depart, dearly departed hero, which only cherished the memory of Jesus. Because without the frequent reminder and remembrance of the Lord's Supper, Christianity can evolve into a philosophy of life, a set of morals, of values, uh, far removed from Jesus and what he did for us. We got to understand that we celebrate the Lord's Supper because of the great sacrifices that he made by his broken body and his shed blood on a cross. And we commemorate the fact that before he went to that cross, he shared a meal with his friends who he knew was going to betray him and who he knew was going to deny them. And he served them. What does that say about us and who we go out to dinner with and who we break bread with? We don't break bread with people we don't really fool with. Questions, comments. So, we remember, 
the crucified one who gave his body and sacrificed his blood that brings on our salvation. By sharing in this meal, we recall, we remember that sacrifice and symbolically share in its benefits. We are here to share in God's broken body and the drink of God's shed blood because we're going to imitate the Jesus example of self-giving. Here around this table, Jesus shows them a model and Paul commemorates that model and reminds us of what Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed. He took bread. My bread is coming. When he giving thanks, she's smiling, coming through the door. My bread is coming. She's going to put it on the table. All right. Stop right there because we don't want the people on um, internet to see who, who bring the stuff late because we already talked about y'all ready. But come on. Praise God for your witness. I didn't know. I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that you had a spirit of lateness, Sister Angie told me. All right. So go on, sit on down. And you're going to stay at the table for the rest of the night while the uh, lesson is going on. So we remember, we reflect on what, you see, you ain't have to do all that. All right, because they ain't have all of that fancy stuff when they was eating this bread and drinking this wine. See, see, that's, see, that's why we late right here. All right? That's why we late here, because they went to go get stuff. Uh-huh. Okay, they put the grapes. She got the bread all covered up like flies. And did I ever tell y'all the reason? Only reason why we cover up the communion table? Did I ever tell y'all the reason why? Cause it flies in the country church. There's no symbolic significance. That's the only reason the table gets covered because in the country, flies will get on the communion. How many things we do in church that have nothing to do with the Bible of Jesus? If it's do it because of what? tradition. I think I just said something. Let me keep moving. See, see all fancy. See, see getting all fancy. Jesus went out like fancy. I'm going to break this bread tonight. We're going to eat this bread tonight. Okay? We're going to eat these grapes. All right? We're not going to drink the wine, though. Okay? You don't want to drink the wine. You got to go somewhere else. All right. All right. Um, so, we are to imitate Jesus' example. I'm just playing. You don't have to stay. Um, <laughs> Okay, can, can you leave my hand out, though? Because I got one down there for you. Thank you. Right there. Right there. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are to imitate Jesus' example by self-giving. Everything we do in this meal should align with his self-sacrifice for others. We should be prepared to give ourselves and our resources to others. What, what do I mean? So Jesus is sitting around this table. He breaks bread. When he gives thanks, gives it to a disciple saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. After supper, he drinks the cup. When he gives thanks, he says, drink ye all of it because this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many. As often as you do it, you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus is in a posture of sharing. with people he knows who are going to betray him and deny him. And he still does it. How many people have we written off in our lives who we think are going to betray us or deny us? Questions, comments? Just call. I thought you were going to have all kinds of questions tonight as I was working on this. And uh, questions, comments? Anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. We got some problems on social media? Oh, that's why. Okay. Okay. All right. Can they go to the website and see? Or the app? Can we send them to the website of the app? They can. So can somebody post a message on social media that they can go to the website of the app um, and, uh, and go from there? Questions? 
broken bread represents Jesus physical body which is broken for you on the cross Jesus body was broken for you now at the last supper y'all it was unleavened bread because it was a Passover feast and it goes back to John the Baptist who was Jesus' cousin who says that Jesus is the Passover lamb because he's without blemish because they behold there's a lamb of God that's going to take away the sins of the whole world. In order for any sacrifice to be made, y'all, there had to be something and it had to be something that was without blemish. Part of the problem, when Jesus went to turn over the tables in the temple, the problem was you had people exploiting outside of the temple, selling animals for jacked up prices more than the people should pay for them trying to make money because the people travel long distances to come to the temple and they did not have the proper things to make a sacrifice, which was an animal, doves, or pigeons. And so, in turn, you got these money changers outside jacking up the prices times two to make money. So that's why Jesus turned the tables over. What did they were selling? It was simply that they was trying to make money off of poor people. Jesus has a problem when we try to exploit people for financial gain. Jesus does not have a problem with us making money, but Jesus has a problem with us making money off of the backs of poor people. Questions, comments? Questions, comments? Move the wine right here, sister. Sister. Caitlin put the stuff over there. Move the wine right there. Okay. All right. Questions now. Questions, comments. So, Jesus breaks bread, but he also has blood. Not only was Jesus' body broken, but came stream out his side was the blood of Jesus the Christ. Now, if you notice, Sister Angie, can we go back to the passage of Scripture and talks about that new covenant? Did we get it all straight, y'all, or they still y'all still working on it? Huh? Okay. It's working on the app. Okay. All right. Uh, can we go back to the uh, to the PowerPoint, Sister Angie? The passage. Go back. A couple of more verses. Okay. No, no, go, no, no. You, 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 you were there. You went too fast. All right, go back one more. Go to twenty-five. In the same way, to the cup, and also after the supper, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you shall drink it, as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, we need to understand, y'all, that Jesus comes and gives us a new covenant that Paul is talking about. He gives us a new covenant because there was a what? Old covenant. An old covenant was between God and his people, and it was based on the law. God chose and approached the people of Israel and became, in a special sense, their God, with the condition that this is the relationship was going to last. They must keep the law. Let's go to Exodus. Everybody pull out the phone. Let's go to Exodus 24, verses 1 through 8. Okay. Got people texting me. All right, everybody there? Exodus 24. Genesis, Exodus. 
Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 24, verses 1 through 8. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship at, di at a distance. Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with me. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice, and said all the words that the Lord has spoken we would do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and he set up twelve pillars corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as well as offerings of well-being to the Lord. Moses took the half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he dashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that has the Lord spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Moses took the blood, dashed it on the people, and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. People could do nothing other than fear God because they were forever in default since they could never perfectly keep the law. God said, y'all can't do all of these commandments. I'm going to give y'all two. Two of these. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind and your strength, and love your neighbor as you love your what? Self. And we still couldn't do them. So Jesus has to come on the scene and give us a what? New covenant because we kept breaking the what? Old covenant. The old covenant. The old covenant. Simply, the old covenant. We were forever in default with the what? Old covenant covenant so Jesus comes in and gives us a what a new covenant covenants are made through the what shedding of blood and a covenant is simply a relationship entered between God the father and his children questions comments now I want to move too fast so with Jesus a new relationship is opened to men and women not dependent on the law but on love not on their ability to keep the law for no one can do that but on the free grace of God's love offered to all it costs Jesus life to make this new covenant possible the red wine of the sacrament stands for the blood of Jesus without which the new covenant and the new relationship of men and women to God could never have been possible questions comments on this new covenant questions questions so it's called you ain't got no questions brother agree i mean brother uh glenn not here tonight so my other person asking questions no questions so it's called are we straight okay questions anybody else got questions questions this new covenant it only happens when jesus comes on the scene Remember Jesus said, I came to what? To give you what? Life and have it more what? Abundantly. So this new covenant is going to supersede the what? The old covenant. This new covenant comes simply because somebody shed their blood and that somebody is Jesus. This new covenant is made between us and God. And there's nothing that we can do that can break God's covenant with us because we didn't shed any blood. He shed blood. What can separate us from the love of God? No death, no life, no angels, no principalities, no rulers, no wickedness, and high or low places. Anything shall be able, nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is what? In Christ. Jesus, This new covenant God made with us when he was hanging on the cross. And the Bible says that the veil was torn in the two, which means that we have what? Access. 
So we no longer have to have sacrifices of doves or any animals because Jesus is the ultimate lamb that was what? Slain. So we all have access. That's why I use inclusive language, men and women, Jews nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. All of us have access. All of us have an opportunity to ha be a part of this new covenant that Jesus gave to us. Questions, comments? So Paul shows us the self-sacrifice with the Corinth contrast of self-sacrifice with the Corinthians and the selfishness at the supper. <sighs> Y'all, if we don't get anything else out of this, what Paul is trying to push on us is they were having major drama at the Lord's table. And it all stemmed from selfishness. Okay, it all stemmed from selfishness. It all stemmed from selfishness. So you want to have a hierarchy at the table. Only certain people can eat on certain sides of the table. Only certain people can eat certain kind of foods. No, Paul is saying, no, we can't have that. Everybody is equal at the what? Table. Okay, Brother Justin. I, I would explain it this way. For me, I would call the servant leaders first because they need grace more than anybody else. And I want to serve them first so they can in turn help me serve everyone else. So Paul's push was not only did you have a hierarchy problem at the table, and not only did they have a rich and a poor people problem at the table, but they had a bad attitude problem at the table. And that's why Paul goes on to push us. When you come to the table, you got to make sure you have the right, right what? Attitude. You can't have pride at the table. Um. We, we as Methodists not only lead in the communion, but we serve the communion over and against our Baptist brothers and sisters who pass it on to the deacons and then the deacons pass it on out. We do that because we believe that ultimately the preacher and the pastor is a servant. That's why we serve. We are what? Servants. I never forget. Um, I was passing the Tallahassee one time. Um, this was Jasmine at New Mount Zion, and uh, or Maria was out of town. Church was packed. I was the only ordained preacher in the house. Um, Bishop Richardson um, and Supervisor Richardson were, were members of the church, and when they come, and I had too much pride to ask the bishop to come help me. And so I'm doing this by myself, sweating, and he goes up, goes washes his hands and say, I'm going to help you because he's a what? A servant. He didn't wait, ask to be served, to help. He saw a need and he what? Met a need. Questions, comments? So the text goes on to say the Corinthians neglected to examine themselves but they were experts at examining everybody else why is it church folks always want to talk about everybody else's sins but don't never want to talk about their own sins we can't become religious detectives who watch others but who fail to acknowledge our own sins. If sin is sin, and if all if we admit that all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God, then why do we put a top ten sin list that this sin is worse than other sins? So Angie, you ain't got no questions tonight either. What's going on with you? 
Huh? You and Sister Carly, y'all ain't got no questions tonight. Okay. All right. So Paul says, if they are proclaiming the Lord's death and what they do at the Lord's Supper, they will not overindulge themselves. They will not despise others. They will not shame them or allow them to go hungry. <coughs> Paul says, if they're proclaiming the Lord's death and what they do at the Lord's Supper, they will not overindulge themselves. They will not despise others. They will not shame others. And they will not allow people to go hungry. Questions. Questions. So, so Paul's warning is those whose behavior at the Lord's Supper does not conform to what the death entails effectively shifts sides. They leave the Lord's side and align themselves with the rulers of this present age. If I don't take seriously the disadvantage, the least, the loss, and the left behind, I no longer am on God's side. I'm on Trump's side. Questions, comments? Just a, I need to get your hand up. Okay, you put your hand down real quick. Mm, all right. Other questions? Questions, comments? So God, Paul gives us, y'all, three tests to decide where one is eating worthily. Number one, we got to examine ourselves. They are, they are to test their genuineness. You know, preachers make up words before God does. They should check their pride at the door. The cross offers a different standard. All are blameworthy before God, and yet all are forgiven because the sins of all have been transferred to Jesus. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. 21st century, a 21st century uh, example of what the Corinthians did then. I'm trying to understand they're at the Lord's supper okay so Paul is correcting them so we got to remember now sister Carla the Lord's supper is in everyone's house it's a potluck dinner and just like we saw when um, the sister who came to bathe Jesus with her tears and just rolled up in the people's house. So Paul is trying to correct them that if you know some people are poor and you don't give them full rights, privileges, and benefits you give everybody else who sit at the table, then you defile the Lord's Supper. Um, okay, give you several examples. I give you um, the Soul Food Sunday example. If somebody does not come with something and we don't let them eat. Um, that's a food example. Um, a another example would be we see people in need but do nothing about it in church we see them in need not that their stuff is hidden but we know that they are in need and we know we're going out to brunch after church and they may be a part of our crowd but they don't go because they really don't have the money and we don't offer the hey I'm going to take care of you today so you ain't got to worry Um, having the bad attitude
attitude at the table. Um, I only speak to certain folks. Or having an attitude, and I, I talk about this later in the handout, that I'm the only one that's self-righteous. All y'all, rest of y'all going to hell. I'm the only one saved. For real, for real saved. Y'all ain't saved. Y'all play, play saved. I'm, I know I'm going to hell. Th those kind of attitudes coming to the table. Those kind of attitudes of creating division among people. Um, one of the persons who worships with us virtually checked me um, on the church anniversary when I said I wanted just a picture with just the founding members they said I should have taken another picture with every member I didn't think about it every member because have I set up a differentiation between founding members and the people who might have just joined the Sunday before I ain't never acknowledged her, so I'm acknowledging her now. Hopefully, hopefully they're watching, but yeah. Thank you for that comment, checking the pastor. And how do you acknowledge the people who worship virtually? Divisions. Paul is dealing with divisions, and his major theme in this teaching is how can we create unity in the body? How can we understand that there are no big eyes, there are no little U's? How can we understand that um, all of us are serving? And how do we, I, I think another example that we struggle with, Sister Carla, is how can we get more people to serve instead of just the same people always serving? Or we just grab the people we know. Okay. Qu questions. Any other questions? other questions second part how we relate to our brothers and sisters all are joined together in Christ share equally in his blessings and should be treated the same um Because we all have a top 10 sin list, we treat people in churches differently based on their sins. What do I mean? I think it's crazy that in 2019, we'll have some churches who will sit down a young lady who is single who gets pregnant but we do nothing to brothers who we know are just living ratchet lives we ain't even dealing with the person who got her pregnant we don't do it as much in the church now as we used to do it but we ostracize people who were divorced So we, we got our own top 10 sin list. But we would dare not deal with people who be at the one-armed bandit places every week. Spending all that. Okay, y'all don't know what the one-armed, the gambling casinos. One-armed bandit place. Check, check. Okay, we, we would dare not we dare not do that. Questions. This is a this is a difficult one. Discerning the body. What is it that the Corinthians do not discern? And the question I raise is, are they being stumbling blocks to the weak? We all have to ask ourselves, are we being a hindrance 
to somebody in the church's spiritual growth. We don't think we are, but are we? If we're not being inclusive and inviting people in, as the Carlos famous quote is, I got it. Instead of saying, no, come on, help me. That's a stumbling block. Is it a stumbling block that we don't go out of our way to connect with people we don't necessarily know? Is it a stumbling block? Everybody doesn't have the just great personality like Sister Jasmine. Some folks just quiet. Are we being a stumbling block when we act like we know everything and don't nobody else know nothing? So Jasmine. I'm not going to lie. God had to break me because I'm kooky. And people in the church were looking at me crazy. And so I would kind of be quiet. But the Lord was like, no, I need you to be as kooky as ever. So you're right. That hindered me for years. But I realized, like mm -hmm. you said, I had to be like that to be inviting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. A anybody else? mentioning that the pastor would like you to do um, such and such because you know how can we get them interested in doing things without mentioning the pastor's name I, I think I think a couple of ways Sister Angie I think we've got to be do we have such warm personalities that people are drawn to us if we have very warm and inviting personalities people can be drawn to us uh, I used to make this statement and I still believe it's true I believe people come to church because of relationships and I can tell you 90% of the people who joined our church came because somebody in the church brought them but I also believe people come to church seeking relationships and I think where we have probably not done a great job or I, I'll definitely say, I'll admit it we failed I don't know if we have cultivated relationships enough intentionally. Now, if a person does not have, if a person has a, you know, out of the going personality like Sister Jasmine, Sister uh, Andrea, but what about a quiet, shy, reserved person? How do we find a way to connect with them intentionally? Uh, one of the beauties of the Methodist Church was, and I, I, I see your hand, Brother Justin, I'm coming. Uh, one of the beauties of the Methodist Church was they created the class leader system. John Wesley created a class leader system because he wanted a bunch of many pastors. And so he in turn said, you know what, I can't pastor these pe all these people, so I need to duplicate myself. And so I'm going to duplicate it myself and Sister Andrea and Sister Jasmine and Brother Grieve and Brother Sister Carla and Sister Aina and Sister Tony and Sister Savetta and Sister Angie and Brother Justin. And they in turn will connect with a small group of people and hold them accountable. Hey, I ain't seen you in church. Everything all right? You need anything? So instead of everything going up, you grow smaller, you grow larger as you grow smaller at the same time. So which means that nobody would ever say, well, the church didn't care about me. I was gone. No, you got several calls. Now, you may not have responded to the text, but you got several calls. And the calls didn't come from the pastor. So I think another way, so I think, Sister Angie, I think we've got to find ourselves and, and, and push ourselves to be more warm and inviting. Uh, particularly to people who we see consistently and we know they're not serving. Hey, come on, go with me. Come on. Come help me. And do we strike up conversations? Once we strike up conversations, then we get to know each other. 
then we can hang out outside of church. Go to Metro Diner for the uh, chicken and waffles, y'all know. Y'all know I'm hooked on the chicken and waffles at Metro Diner. Okay? All right? Uh, other questions? Yes, sir, Brother Greeley. I agree with you on what you're saying about reaching out to people. I know for myself, I think the one thing I got to do is be consistent. There was one sister that used to come here. I think she did hair for Bible study. And I think when that was a night we exchanged numbers and say, hey, let's reach out to each other just to hold each other accountable. And I, I texted her one time when you said uh, reach out to people that you know you haven't seen in a while. I sent out texts. She never responded. I just gave up first time. And I realized I should have either try two more times and if not like I do with Sister Carla if I remember somebody but I don't really know them I say hey Sister Carla do you know such and such I, the one that used to sit over here with the you know whatever outfit or hair and then let her reach out or if she doesn't know about if I don't know anybody she don't know anybody she'll find somebody who will reach out to them who know them more mm -hmm. okay Any, anybody else questions yes ma'am young lady made about you're taking the picture with mm -hmm. the founding when when we do things like that it wasn't intentionally to separate but she called you on it you said okay but how do you move on from there because some people will hold that against you forever and ever and ever because you made this one mistake mm -hmm. that hurt their feelings and I think um, that person, Sister Carla, is a mature believer. And I think we have to admit that everybody is not a mature believer. And I, I love to use this illustration. Sister Tony was growing up. You had the grown folk table and you had the kids table. And any time the kids tried to say something in the grown folk conversation, the grown folks will say, shut up. They ain't say be quiet. They say, shut up. This is grown folks conversation. And I'm convinced, Sister Carla, part of our problem is we have put believers who are still at the kids' table and invited them into mature believer conversations that they ain't ready for. We're trying to feed them table food and they still on milk. The challenging part is how do we acknowledge that that's where they are? And we've already said we're not going to look down on our noses on people who are not where we are. But how do we bring them on slowly? Because some people think they want to jump into the pool until they figure out they can't swim. And lifeguards will tell you they will not jump in and save you until you stop trying to fight. Because if you keep on trying to fight, you'll try to kill, you'll kill both of them. <coughs> but when you can't fight anymore, that's when they can save you. The problem is, Sister Carla, We've got some immature believers who jumped in to the deep end of the pool and they're still trying to fight and they have not given up so we can rescue them. And they're not even ready for us to throw the life, say, life preserve for them because they're still fighting. Sister Caitlin, you had your hand up? just saying if we all are created equal how do you determine or distinguish who are the immature and the mature believers? By signs. Um, th thank you for my fruit. The Bible says they'll, you'll know, they'll know you by the what? Fruit you bear. Immature believers are not bearing this many grapes. They may be bearing some grapes, but they ain't bearing this many grapes. This many grapes. This many grapes. 
immature believers, well, let me say this. Let me say it this way. Mature believers know that it's not about me, but it's about him. Mature believers are not serving and will not get mad when somebody makes them mad and walk away. Mature believers are givers regardless of who the pastor is. Mature believers are going to read their word, are going to meditate outside of church. Mature believers, and, and Reverend Elaine Flake gave me this, mature believers don't need anybody to feed them. They'll feed themselves. An immature believer still needs to be fed. I think I just said something. Thank you, Reverend Elaine Flake. Okay. Qu questions. Other questions. So, so, so Paul goes on and ends and says, when you understand what the Lord's Supper is, when you understand the great sacrifices that Jesus made for us, it should change your attitude and your behavior toward each other. It reminds them of their dependence on Jesus and their interdependence on each other. Problem is, we got this I generation who lives in isolation and is okay with that. And they think it makes them look weak to ask people for help. And our interdependence should cause us to share our own provisions with others at the meal who have little or nothing. Paul is arguing. When they recognize the meaning of the sacrifice of Jesus, remembered in reenacting the Lord's Supper, they would act compassionately toward others. The Lord's Supper becomes the starting point of transformation of relationships of the relationships and structures in the community I, 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 I put this Bible study together tonight not only because I, I don't know if we really grasp the Lord's Supper but because we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper on Sunday we should leave the table being transformed ready to go out and serve the world saying I'm going to be a better believer in May than I was in April the problem is Sister Carl as I said on Sunday we have TV dinner spirituality to Jasmine broke me down Monday service because to sit at the table and actually put yourself there mm -hmm. and to know that okay they about to come get Jesus that it broke me mm -hmm. so like like you said it, I left transformed because I like you said sometimes it can become ritualistic but when you place yourself there mm -hmm. it, it, it messed me up and that we sat in the same seats because we betrayed Jesus yes that got me because I ain't passing. We denied him. Man. We deny him the opportunity to be Lord in our lives because we're not ready to give up control. You with me Thursday. You got me. You did. We're not. We're not ready to die daily. Questions, comments? My time is almost up. All right. I want to thank Sister. Caitlin to bring in these grapes. We're going to all eat some of these grapes tonight. And, all right. They're sweet grapes. He, she already washed them off, y'all. So, okay. We have a question online. Yes, ma'am. It says. We finally got up to Facebook. We got, <laughs> okay. Praise Yahweh. It says, when members are going through crisis and difficult things and times 
it is wrong for them to humble themselves and take on serving at their own levels or steps. I'm not sure. Okay. Say that again. Rewind that. When members are going through crisis and difficult things and times, is it wrong for them to humble themselves and take on serving at their own levels? The question I would mean, I, I want to raise is what's their own levels? What does that mean? I, I don't understand the question. Um, do I think there are times when a person needs to take a step back from serving? Yes, but for me taking a step back does not mean go home and sit down. It may mean that I may not be the leader, but I can still serve. Um, do I have to always be the person in charge? I can't serve unless I'm in charge. Um, can I just be the person, you know what? If we do a clarion call, um, we're in this effort, y'all, to um, raise this money for these 100 computers for the homeless high school seniors, praise God. Um, and the few texts I sent out the other day, we got 15 computers already in, already on our way to the 100. Um, one member told me today their job committed to send, giving, um, purchasing two computers, so that means we had 17. Um, I think I got another member who gave some money last night, so I'm up to 18 and hadn't bought those yet. Um, so when we're going to send a clarion call out to wrap these computers, you may be like me and fail cutting in kindergarten, but you can still come help take out the trash. You can still come and help, okay, do you have enough tape? Because if you're really a truly a servant, you're going to what? Serve regardless of what needs to be what? Done. If you're really truly a servant, you'll be the Bible study late because the pastor called you at the last minute to go get some grapes and a loaf of bread. If you're a servant and you don't complain when he puts you on blast all over the world. <laughs> okay? If you're a servant. I again say serving is never convenient. It is never convenient. Questions, comments? I don't think I'm through. Did, did, they, did we answer their questions, Sister um, Andrea? Did they hit back? Before I shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. Oh, she's responding. Okay. Any other questions in the house? Any other questions? Any other questions? So, so Angie, I brought the table out for you. You don't even need to have to move it back. Um, it's already there for Sunday. Just drop it down. Okay? Anybody else? Questions, comments? Okay. Uh, those who are worshiping digitally with us, uh, we want to encourage you um, to partner with us. Uh, we are in the midst of an uh, effort to purchase 100 computers for homeless high school students who are graduating in this county. Uh, there are 20, uh, there are 2,000, 2,800 high schoolers in Broward County who are homeless. Homeless means they either live on their own, they live with a friend, they live in cars, they live in hotels, um, they live in shelters, um, but they are registered as homeless. And we want to be a blessing. Last year we purchased 120 laptop computers, and the computer cost $200. So if you want to be a part of this effort, you can give several ways. You can give cash app, dollar sign, the Emmanuel Temple. Or you can go to our church website or our app and click online giving and laptop uh, laptops for homeless students for $200. Um, and uh, like I said, we got 15 already in, got two commitments today and one person gave last night. So we're on our way. Uh, the
the end of the month. End of May. End of May, I'm sorry. End of May. Okay? And there'll be a great celebration that we're going to have. Uh, we're going to wrap the gifts. Then we'll take them to, they have a graduation ceremony strictly for homeless students. Uh, with their cap and gowns and their families. Um, and so you don't know how it will bless a child's life to see a child. Because this is, um, if we don't get these computers, um, these kids won't have them. And they're going to be going off to college and other things. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Our hearts and minds are clear. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for reminding us that there should never be trouble at the table. Because the table is open to whosoever will. The table is accessible. The table is powerful because you sit at the table. And so, God, we thank you for your shedding of blood. We thank you, God, for the breaking of your body. And so, God, thank you for moving us and inspiring us and transforming us to lead transformed lives. We thank you, God, for these who are sitting in the sanctuary. We thank you, God, for those who are digital disciples, God. We thank you for how you're going to bless our efforts to reach our goals for 100 computers, um, to be a blessing to children who are in need. You said, God, that which you've done unto the least of these, you've also done it unto you. And so, God, we want to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good night, everybody. Thank you all so much for those who are worshiping um, uh, virtually. Um, and uh, we can cut the camera off and we're going to eat these grapes. <laughs>